Okay, we're back for part two of chapter two, and we have still have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and jump right back in. And if you recall, we were looking at different categories of crimes, um, and we left off and we didn't finish with identity theft. So I wanted to make sure this gets in there because it's such a, a, a big deal right now. So, you know, there are, you know, there's cyber crime, cyber theft, all these different things. And identity theft is one of those things that you're going to run into very, very frequently, especially now in the age of computers. So one of the country's fastest growing crimes is identity theft, an offense in which someone unlawfully obtains and uses another person's personal data in some form or fashion that's going to involve fraud or deception. It's usually for economic gain. It's both a high tech and a low tech crime. And, and I ask why, and I'll let you just kind of think about that. If you want to actually know the section of identity theft, you can go there and, and take a look. But I wanted to make sure that we got that in there. And then ritualistic crime, um, you won't run into this a lot, but you do need to know that it's out there. This would be the unlawful act committed during a ceremony related to a belief system. And when you investigate ritualistic crime, you know, the big thing you need to remember is you're investigating the crime, not the belief system. Okay. Because, you know, people believe different things and they have the right to believe, you know, different things. Um, so we investigate the actual crime that occurred, not the belief system. All right. So now we're going to talk about sources of crime data. So the primary sources of crime data routinely used to measure the nature and extent of crime um, are surveys and official records collected, compiled, and analyzed by the government agencies such as the Federal Government's Bureau of Justice Statistics and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So we're going to talk a little bit about what they call the Uniform Crime Report. Okay, And, and again, this is the, the, the agency that houses the annual statistics data by law enforcement agencies as it relates to certain information. So the, the UCR for short, the Uniform Crime Report, compiled by the FBI, this national survey compiles criminal acts reported to local police and it publishes the data yearly in the Bureau's Uniform Crime Report. Now, the UCR includes crimes and numbers of arrests and some other data from over 17,000 law enforcement agencies to include city, county, metropolitan, and geographical areas in the United States. Its major analysis, even though it does give you data on a lot of things, its major focus or analysis is on what they call part one crimes. OK, these are what they call crimes against persons. We already looked at this a little bit. Violent crime and crimes against property, property crimes. So every year, law enforcement agencies, both state and federal, are required to report part one crimes. And then some other things they have to report, like hate crimes and stuff like that. But let me show you what it looks like so that way you know. Now, remember, uh, just a little bit ago, they broke down the property crimes in our lecture into, you know, the theft ones and the damage ones. So like larceny and like arson. Here, when agencies report their crimes, it's either going to be crimes against persons or crimes against property. And let me show you the crimes. So part one crimes include murder, rape, burglary, robbery, assault. Larceny theft, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Okay, so hopefully you kind of um, you, you've got all of those listed down in here, and you can see homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, arson, and here is just so you know, is a chart that shows Rialto's. 12, 13, and 14, 2012, 13, and 14 data, homicides, rapes, robberies, and you can see how some crime was actually going down a little bit. Um, but this is what you report every single, every single year, okay? Uh, the UCR program also collects arrest data on, you know, on part one offenses, 
and 21 other crimes that, you know, that comprise the part two offenses. But again, typically your focus is going to be these part one crimes, your violent crimes, your property crimes. And I put in some, you know, crime data. This is a crime clock that the FBI puts out from 2014 to 2019. So I, I know that's kind of confusing a little bit, um, but I want you just to kind of understand a little bit on how that kind of happens. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, compiling these reports are kind of difficult. The methods used to compile the UCR are complex. Again, each month, law enforcement agencies report the number of part one crimes known to them. You know, these data, you know, this data is collected from records from all crime complaints that victims, officers who discover the crimes or other sources, you know, are reported to these agencies. So it, it's, it, you have to look at the UCR and go, well, what's the downfall of the UCR? Well, it's only what's reported, right? If victims don't report it, then they're not going to be able to, to get that data. So remember, part one crimes. Part two crimes are all those other crimes reported to the FBI, but they're less serious. You know, they're misdemeanors and some other things. All right. Well, what about something called clearance rates? So in addition, each month, law enforcement agencies report how many crimes were cleared. And crimes are cleared in two ways. One, when at least one person is arrested, charged, and turned over to the court for prosecution, that clears the case, or two, by what they call exceptional means, meaning when some element beyond police control precludes the arrest. So let's say that we know that, you know, John Smith did this homicide, but he fled to a country that we can't extradite him from. We can still clear that case because we know it's John Smith, but we can't physically arrest him because he's in a country where we can't get him from. Okay, this data also includes the value of property because we know in those part one crimes, there's, there's value to things that are stolen, right? Traditionally, slightly more than 20% of part one crimes are cleared by arrest. That's just kind of a little bit of information. Um, and cleared again is, you know, an offense is cleared by arrest or solved when at least one person is arrested or charged, etc. And, and here's a little chart they put in your textbook that shows 2014 uh, percent of crimes cleared by arrest or by exceptional means. Okay, so what then is the validity of the UCR, right? Remember, we talked about what it does. Well, let's look at some concerns for the UCR report. Well, the first one would be reporting practices. So there's really three main concerns. Many victims do not report crimes to the police. So they're not part of that UCR report, right? And it could be because they don't trust law enforcement. There's no insurance. So if someone steals something off your porch and you don't have insurance, there's no way to cover it. You just don't report it. Maybe fear of reprisal, meaning that you're afraid the suspects are going to come back and do something else. Or some people consider things a private matter. You know, or put it this way, maybe you go to buy something illegal somewhere and someone rips you off, let's say at gunpoint and robs you, you're not going to go to the police and said you tried to buy something illegal and then you were robbed. Does that kind of make sense? So it could be a private thing or some people just consider it a private matter and they don't do anything about it. Another concern would be your the law enforcement practice, meaning the way that departments record or report information. So they might be doing the coding wrong in their records department. So that's a concern. And then finally would be the methodological problems. Okay, uh, maybe no federal crime reported. Not all police departments submit reports. Uh, the FBI, you know, uses estimates in its total crime projections. What about multiple crimes? Usually the most serious is recorded within. How do you record all the other ones? Each act listed as a single offense for some crimes. 
you know, incomplete acts are lumped together with completed acts. So there's all these different things, right? So how do you, you know, so these are just concerns. And it's worked fairly well over the years, but there still are these three concerns when you talk about the UCR. So another mechanism or source of data would be the National Incident-Based Reporting System, NIBRS. It's a form of crime data collection created by the FBI requiring local police departments to provide at least a brief account of each incident and arrest within 22 crime patterns, including the incident, victim, and offender information. So this is how you get like offender information or victim information. It requires local police agencies to provide at least a brief account of each incident and arrest, again, including the incident, victim, offender information. And there are expanded crime categories things like blackmail, embezzlement, drug offenses, and bribery. So this is another system um, that's, that's basically out there. Um, and, and so, okay, so just kind of keep track by definition. That's NIBRS. Now let's look at the NCVS. So, or the National Crime Victimization Survey. The ongoing victimization study conducted jointly by the Justice Department and the U.S. Census Bureau that surveys victims about their experience with law enforcement. Okay, so because more than half of all victims do not report their experiences to police, the UCR can't measure all the criminal activity, right? Because if no one reports it, you can't record it in the UCR. So to address that, to fill the gap, the Bureau of Justice Statistics sponsors that the, the National Crime Victimization Survey. Okay, it is a, a comprehensive nationwide um, survey of victimization in the United States. It started back in 1973 and provides a more detailed picture of crime incidents, victims, and trends. So that's the NCVS. Um, okay, so we kind of, you know, survey collects, you know, victim data. So if you look at the bottom here, it talks about, you know, age, sex, ethnicity, marital status. It collects suspects data on age, sex, ethnic relationship to the, vic the victim, um, location, weapon, etc. So a lot more data to kind of help fill some of the blanks from the other report. And then we have what we call self-reporting surveys. And these surveys ask offenders themselves to report about their criminal behaviors. One of the most important surveys that's out there is called Monitoring the Future. And I have a link to their website. And it, it, it this typically is gauged more towards um, younger folks, because it talks a lot about uh, drinking um, and, and smoking and drugs and things like that. But it is considered the national standard for measuring things like substance abuse and, and, and trends, etc. among teens. But what issue can you kind of see with the validity of a report like this, where you're going to be asking, you know, someone to uh, talk about what they did or something. Okay. Um, you know, one of the big things with, with that, it, critics of self-report studies suggest that it's really unreasonable to expect people to admit their illegal acts, right? So it's kind of hard. Um, so here, whereas the NVCS is designed to measure victimization directly and criminal activity indirectly, participants in self-reported surveys, they're asked to describe in detail their recent and lifetime participation in crime. And critics of these surveys suggest that it's really, you know, is everybody really going to be willing to tell you candidly and admit that they did this, that they took drugs, that they committed theft, that they did a robbery? So those are, those are some issues, right? So again, when you evaluate the sources of crime data, and we've gone through a few, okay, you know, the UCR, the NCVS, and the self-reports, those are kind of the big ones. The, those are the standard sources of data used by criminologists to track trends and patterns. But the UCR may not include information 
the victim chooses not to report. And the NCVS relies on recollection, which may be inaccurate. And then self-reports rely on honesty of the person. And, and that, that's kind of tough. Um, uh, be mindful of several limitations present when interpreting crime data. You know, official statistics only reflect reported crimes, and these are voluntary and vary in accuracy and completeness. And furthermore, it's estimated that less than half of the crimes, you know, committed are, are actually reported. Um, and then finally, we'll talk really quick about NIBRS. So we talked about the big three, but the National Incident-Based Reporting System, you know, efforts to redesign and modernize the UCR resulted in the development of NIBRS. And this requires local agencies to provide, again, at least a brief account of each incident and arrest, including the victim and offender information. Um, and, and this allows, you know, the national database, you know, on the nature of crime, criminals to be developed also on hate and bias crimes, et cetera. All right. And then I know it's kind of confusing, but these charts are very helpful where you can look at each one of these things we talked about, the big three of the UCR, the NCVS, and self-reported surveys. And, and you know, we're going to talk now about crime trends, and it's important to understand when you look at crime trends. Um, so here, this pyramid, it's kind of interesting. So the UCR covers just arrests, right? The UCR reported crime. So here's arrests, and here's crime. So that's what the UCR gives you, OK? Then you have the NCVS, which is supposed to pick up the rest. And then you have unknown crimes because, you know, it's when you think about crime trends, you know, the true number of crimes is, is called the dark figure of crime because you really don't know. Not everybody reports, not everybody does the surveys, not everybody does, you know, so you, you, you know what you know, which is kind of, you know, when you look at this, this photo, you can see here, you can, you know, you can calculate the iceberg above the water, but down below, you just kind of don't know. So now let's jump into some crime trends. So by 1995, police recorded about 13.5 million crimes. Since then, with few exceptions, the number of crimes has been in decline. And here's an old crime clock um, on the right-hand side. But keep in mind, the last couple of years, while overall, over the last you know several decades, we know that crime has gone down, the past couple of years in certain cities, some violent crime has, there's an uptick. It has gone up. But just know that for the most part, it's gone down. About 9.4 million crimes were reported in 2014, a drop of over 4 million reported crimes since the 1995 peak, despite the boost of about 56 million in the general population. So population is going up. And crimes are still kind of going down. About 1.2 million violent crimes are now being reported to you know the police each year, a rate of around 365 per 100,000 people. Violent crime did increase in 2011 and 2012. Some larger cities, and I threw this in there, have experienced some increases recently. Okay. <coughs> Now, the property crime rate has also been in decline. At its peak in 1991, about 13 million property crimes were reported. Currently, about 8 million property crimes are reported annually to police. But we don't know about those unreported crimes, right? We still don't know about that. When you talk about victimization, according to the latest NCVS, because remember, that's what tracks Victim information. So if you remember the NCVS, what's it stand for? The National Crime Victimization Survey, data collected from, you know, it's a national survey. Uh, the strengths are that it includes crimes not reported to the police, right? Okay, so that, you know, that's what's cool about it. So according to the NCVS survey, U.S. residents aged 12 or older experienced about 5.4 million violent and 15.3 million property victimizations. Uh, victimization did increase in 2011 and 2012 because we saw that there were some violent crime um, aspects that increased there too. 
Um, some trends in self-reporting. Self-report results appear to be more stable than the UCR. When the results of recent self-report surveys are compared with various studies conducted over a 20-year period, there is a uniform pattern that emerges. So when you look at um, you know, different crimes, et cetera, so you can see the violent crime rate, and here is from 96 to 2015. So you have violent crime in the blue and property crime. You can see back in, you know, 90, they talk about 95, 96 being the peak, and you can still see how things are typically going down. Kind of leveled out a little bit here for a bit. And then, of course, you might have a little bit of uptick over the last year or so with some cities. Uh, victimizations reported to police. It's a little chart that shows the percent of victimizations reported to police from 93 to 2015. So you can see these are violent victimization, property, and then serious. So you can kind of you can kind of tell. Percentage of U.S. residents age 12 or older who were victims of violent crime, excluding simple assault. So you can kind of look at the trends. All right. So, I mean, just it's interesting just to look at the crime trends, right? And to kind of see what, you know, what happens. All right. So <clears throat> well, let's talk a little bit about, about crime patterns. So criminologists look for stable crime patterns to gain insight into the nature of crime. And the, the cause of crime may be better understood by examining the rate. If, for example, criminal statistics consistently show that crime rates are higher in poor neighborhoods in large urban areas, then the cause of crime may be related to poverty and neighborhood decline. Now, if in contrast, crime rates are spread you know, evenly across society and the rates are equal in poor and you know, more affluent neighborhoods, this would suggest that, you know, crime has little economic basis. Instead, crime might be linked to things like socialization, personality, intelligence, or some other trait unrelated to class position or income. So let's take a look at a couple of these different crime patterns, if you will. So first, we'll look at what they call the ecology of crime. Patterns in the crime rate seem to be linked to temporal or, you know, ecological factors. Temporal meaning warm or cold, temperature. So most reported crimes occur during the warm summer months of July and August. During the summer, teenagers are out of school. People spend more time outdoors. Homes are left unoccupied as people go on vacations, etc. Um, you know, two exceptions would be, say, robbery and murder. Typically, it's December and January. So the day, the season, and the climate, and then you have to consider things like regional differences, like urban versus uh, rural. So all of these different things. And then remember, I made a comment earlier about the fact that um, during the summertime, there's more kids that are out of school. So it is quite possible that, uh, you know, certain crimes might go up, right? Then you have the social class or the socioeconomic conditions in crime. Official statistics indicate that crime rates in inner city high poverty areas are generally higher than those in suburban or wealthier areas. Um, and, and that, you know, when you, that kind of comes down to what they call the, the, the class crime relationship. You know, what is the connection between class and crime? It makes sense that crime is inherently a lower class phenom phenomenon, right? After all, people at the lowest, you know, end of the social structure have the greatest incentive to commit crimes. And those who are undergoing financial difficulties are the ones who are most likely to become, you know, involved or even their targets, right? It seems logical that people who are unable to obtain what they need to get, those goods and services, etc., through conventional means might resort to theft or other illegal activities um, such as 
you know, selling narcotics, et cetera, in order to get those. So, you know, and then there's other things when you talk about socioeconomic conditions, it could be alcohol or drug abuse. It could be um, anxiety, frustration, or rage. So, you know, there's a lot of contemporary research that shows the association between poverty and crime may be a community level thing rather than an individual level phenomenon. So a lot of, you know, things to think about when it comes to social class, socioeconomic conditions and crime. Um, age and crime. There is, you know, a general agreement that age is kind of inversely related to criminality, regardless of economic status, marital status, sex, and so on. Younger people commit more crime often than their older counterparts. Youths, let's say age 14 to 17, make up about 6% of the U.S. population, but they also represent about 15% of all the arrests. Peak age for property crime is believed to be about 16 and for violent crime about 18. And there's different rationales on, on why they would get involved in crime, things like that, but it could be gratification, uh, deviance is fueled by the need for money or sex, uh, you know, or, or things are reinforced by their peers. Um, you know, these different things that kind of come about. Gender and crime. Male crime rates are much higher than female. Victims report that their assailant was male in more than 80% of all violent personal crimes. Most recent UCR report, you know, arrest statistics indicate that males account for 80% of serious violent crime and more than 6% of arrests for serious property crimes. And, and when you kind of try to explain that, um, you know, early criminologists pointed to emotional and physical differences between males and females to explain those, those differences in crime, if you will. So again, you know, differences in the crime rate. Um, why, why are there some differences actually in the crime rate? Well, traits, it could be physical strength and hormonal differences. Uh, it could be socialization and development. Uh, women who are socialized to avoid being violent and aggressive and are supervised more closely than boys. That could be a reason. Could be cognitive differences that, you know, girls have been found to be superior in their communication skills. So they're more likely to negotiate than fight. So these, these are some differences as it relates to, um, you know, age, gender, um, et cetera. Uh, what about race and crime? Something called a system bias. Some critics charge that race-based differences in the crime rate can be explained by unequal treatment by the justice system. Police might be more likely to stop a younger black youth uh, when they might not an older person um, who is white or even black. Um, and there's, you know, uh, one of the definitions to kind of look at would be something called the, the racial threat hypothesis. The view that minority males are subject to greater police control as the population increases. There could be some other things that are built into this, right? Um, could be cultural bias. Another explanation of racial differences in the crime rate rests on the effects of the, the legacy of racial discrimination on personality and behavior. The fact that U.S. culture influences African-American crime rates is underscored by the fact that black violence rates are much lower in other nations. Um, structural bias. A third view is that racial differences in the crime rate are a function of disparity in the social and economic structure of society. So you can see there's a lot of rationales, right? And it's important that we kind of understand these as they relate to, um, you know, the crime patterns as, as we're kind of talking about. Um, and then chronic offending and crime. Okay, and we talk a little bit about, you know, career criminals. Crime data show that most offenders commit a single criminal act and upon arrest discontinue their antisocial activity, if you will. 
Others commit a few less serious crimes. But a small group of offenders, however, account for the majority of all criminal offenses. And these persistent offenders are referred to as career criminals or chronic offenders. All right. And, and by definition, career criminal, persistent repeat offender who organize their lifestyle around criminality. And a chronic offender, as defined by Marvin Wolfgang, Robert Figlio, and Thorsten Sellen, delinquents arrested five or more times before the age of 18 who commit a disproportionate amount of all criminal offenses. So just a couple of definitions as, as it relates to uh, career criminals, etc. And what causes this chronic offending and crime? Um, a lot the term could be what they call uh, chronicity. Um, it could be early onset, meaning the beginning of antisocial behavior during very early kind of growth years, adolescence years, after which criminal behavior is more likely to kind of present itself throughout that particular, you know, that person's particular lifespan. You know, and, and what causes that, uh, you know, we talked about it, the, the cause of that chronicity, that early onset. Okay, so finally, we're going to finish up with what we're going to call uh, policy implications. And we're just a little over the 30 minute mark, so we're just about right on time. So, you know, the chronic offender has become a central focus of crime uh, and, and crime control policy. Apprehension and punishment seem to have little effect on the offending behavior of chronic offenders, and most repeat their criminal acts after their release from a correctional facility, right? They, they do it again after they get released from prison. So because chronic offenders rarely learn from their mistakes, sentencing policies designed to basically incapacitate uh, chronic offenders for long periods of time without hope of probation or parole have been established. And incapacitation rather than rehabilitation in, in this realm is the goal. So among the policies brought about by the chronic offender concept are mandatory sentences for violent or drug related crimes um, or three strikes laws, sentencing codes that require an offender uh, to basically receive a life sentence after conviction for a third felony, that third strike. And some states offer parole after a lengthy prison term. And then finally, you have a definition called truth and sentencing. And this is a sentencing scheme under policy implications that requires that offenders serve at least 85% of their original sentence before being eligible for parole or any other type of release. So you gotta, you gotta serve that 85% first before you can be eligible for your release. Uh, and here's a little kind of a chart that shows the distribution of offenses uh, for Philadelphia. So what does the future hold? Well, it's risky to speculate the future of crime trends. Researchers speculate an increase in crime in the future due to a large popula population of children currently under the age of 10 who will soon be reaching their teens, etc. At the same time, this could be offset by the aging population. Some research indicates that immigration has a kind of a suppressor effect on crime and studies are mixed on whether poor economy or strong economy helps to lower crime rates and gun availability, gang membership, uh, medical technology and criminal opportunity or other factors to consider as, as we kind of speculate or think about what the future holds as it relates to uh, crime trends. Okay, so just about the 34 minute mark, not too bad. So this will conclude um, part two of chapter two, talking about the nature and extent of crime.